good evening everyone. It's good to be with you again tonight. But now, I want to go ahead and get started because tonight's topic is one of my favorites. This is a very exciting topic. I always love talking about the end times, or if you want to be fancy and technical, I love talking about eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the end times. Now, many people think that eschatology is not that important, and a lot of people don't worry about whether things are premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial. A lot of people think... Uh, their only concern is that everything just pans out in the end. Now, rest assured, for us who are in Christ, for Christians, everything will pan out in the end, but there are so many important doctrinal truths that deal with the end times. In fact, Bible prophecy takes up about 27% of all of the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament combined. 27% of the Bible deal with prophecy. Much of prophecy deals with the second coming. As we have second coming of Christ, now as we have learned in church on numerous occasions, uh, like during our, was past Sunday during service uh, in our Thessalonians study, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18 deals with the rapture among other things. Uh, but eschatology and prophecy are very important. They deal, uh, so much of the scripture deals with eschatology. In fact, for every one verse about the first coming of Christ, um, when he came in the manger, for every verse the Bible speaks of the first coming, there are eight verses that speak of the second coming. So the second coming of Christ, and, and be it the second coming meaning the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ where he comes back to the earth, or the rapture of the church where he comes to the air uh, for his saints. We're going to talk about the difference between those two things tonight. Those uh, topics are very, very prevalent in the scripture. Now, we will not possibly be able to talk about all the Bible says tonight about the rapture and the second coming. We will talk about a lot tonight. This is going to be about a 14-hour study, so I hope you have some popcorn. Not really. We'll, we'll just go until we're done here. It will not be 14 hours tonight, I promise. I can't stand that long tonight. But uh, uh, we'll pick up next week again, whatever we don't get through to uh, or get to tonight. All right? So um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we will get started. We're talking about the differences between the rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together online here on Facebook. Lord God, thank you for those who are watching with us live now. Lord, and I'm just, just very thankful that others will be able to see this study as well on Facebook uh, later on. They can see the replay or also on our website and on YouTube as we get that posted tonight as well. But thank you for, for all of those who are here with us tonight. I pray that our study is fruitful and productive tonight. I pray that questions will be answered tonight and that we will all see what the Bible has to say about the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ. I pray that everyone watching, watching and listening tonight will be able to see the differences between those two glorious events. I pray that folks will be edified. I pray that folks will be encouraged knowing that Jesus Christ has not appointed his bride, the church, to wrath, but he will come for us. And I pray that we see that and that we will bank on that, that we will be so um, just enamored with the love that Christ has for us because he has given us these promises. Not only has he saved us from the penalty of our sins, but he will save us from the wrath of God that is to be poured out upon this earth on Satan, his fallen angels along with him, and those who reject Jesus Christ. What a horrible time that's going to be. That seven year tribulation period, unlike anything else the world has experienced, even um, worse off than anything that could possibly happen during the time of COVID-19 and quarantine and pandemics here upon the earth right now. It's going to be much worse, but you have promised many things unto your church um, pertaining to our rescue from your wrath. And so, Lord, I pray as we begin studying this tonight and, and next week, Lord willing, as well, and, and for however long it takes till we answer all the questions that folks have, I pray that we will do rightly by your word tonight, that we would let the scripture speak for themselves, that we will not try to impose an outline on the scripture, but we will, we will let the scripture speak forth the truth, and we will just take that truth as it is proclaimed in your word. I pray that right now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Got a little excited there while I was praying. All right, so tonight we're talking about the differences between the rapture of the church and the second coming. Now, there's an awful lot for us to cover tonight. Again, we may not get it all done tonight. Uh, I, I asked you probably about 30 minutes ago, many of you, how long you wanted tonight. You want the long version or the short, short version? And Brad rightfully said the short version with me usually is long anyway, so um, he's right about that. But we'll go tonight. Uh, I'll get through as many of these points as we can. And uh, whenever uh, maybe you're tired, I'm tired, maybe we'll all get tired at the same time, we'll go ahead and close out, we'll pray, and then we'll pick up next time. I'm also going to put on our website. Now, our website is www.gpehchurch.com. That's gpehchurch.com. I'm going to put on our website uh, some notes from this study. You will also find an awful lot about the rapture, the second coming, about the tribulation period, about the end times. Uh, Specifically, you'll find all of those things on our website. You'll find some things in our blog post on our website. There's a blog page you'll have to scroll through. Um, but also in our sermon tab, the sermon page has many, 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 many sermons. In fact, we, we just finished in February, I believe, a 18 or 19 month study of the book of Revelation. And every one of those sermons have been posted on our website. I say that now I'm thinking there may be one or two that we lost, but I'll, I'll look back at that. But almost every one, if not every one, uh, of those sermons have been posted on our website. So you can find a plethora of information about the end times. Now, we believe that um, the Bible tells us everything we know need to know for life and godliness. Amen? So everything we need to know for life and godliness is found in the pages of Scripture. And we like to let the Scriptures speak forth for themselves. So the way I preach, the way I study and prepare and then preach uh, and teach, I like to do what's called expositional teaching or preaching, meaning I like to let the Scripture speak out what is supposed to be known and said. Uh, rather than uh, other ways that people do, they try to impose their, their beliefs into the text and find text uh, Scriptures that maybe help them make a point. So they'll come up with an outline and some points, and then they'll just find Scriptures that kind of match up. But oftentimes when folks do that, and, and I was guilty of doing this in the past as well, oftentimes what happens is when we do that, we, we take verses out of context. And so we don't want to do that. We want to be very careful to take Scripture in context. So I believe it was Greg Kokel that said, never read a Bible verse. That's it. Never read a Bible verse. You don't want to just take a verse. You want to make sure you read before the verse and after the verse. That way you begin to get the context of the verse. The three most important Rules for studying the Bible are these. Ready? Number one is context. Number two is context. That's right. And number three is, oh, lo and behold, context. That's right. So always remember that. You want to never just read one verse and then, then take some meaning from it. You need to make sure you're reading it in context. And so for our study of the book of Revelation at Grace Point and Eagle Heights Church, where I pastor, we studied the entire book verse by verse. We started at chapter 1, verse 1, and went all the way to the end of the book. That way, we couldn't just focus on my favorite parts, or we couldn't just uh, take a verse and then let it say anything we want it to say, or make it say anything we want it to say. We took it in context. That keeps us honest to the text and allows the text to speak forth the truths that God wants for us. In fact, he gave us all scripture for life and godliness. Amen? So, enough of all that. Let's jump in tonight. Some of you are thinking right now that uh, uh, we've lost, uh, what, about 10 minutes already with this introduction? That's 10 minutes we'll never get back. <laughs> so, let's jump in. The differences between the rapture of the church and the second coming. Now, the rapture and the second coming are often confused. Now, sometimes even... For, for those of us who study the scriptures a lot, uh, it's oftentimes difficult to understand if we just look at a verse, if it's talking about the rapture or the second coming. And, and, and before we go forward, let me just say that there are, the reason I'm distinguishing between these two, because we have brothers and sisters in Christ. Now we have Christians who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. There are those who believe that the rapture and the second coming are one and the same thing. Now I disagree. I think tonight, after we go through these verses that we're going to look at, I think if you are one of those people who think the rapture and the second coming are one and the same thing, I think that after our time tonight, 
you will be drawn to the same conclusion that I've come up to, with. It, that is a conclusion that's not new to me. It's been passed down through the through through history for years and years and years. Uh, I mean, we go all the way back to the first century where the Apostle John was giving scripture, where he taught about the rapture. We see church leaders in the second centuries and even beyond talking about the rapture. The rapture is not the invention of John Darby or C.I. Schofield. It's not. It goes all the way back to the apostles. And we can look at some of that history at another time as well. Tonight we're going to deal with the differences though. Rapture and second coming. Now, before I, before I took that little side trip, that rabbit trail, if you will, what I was saying was that sometimes it's difficult to know if a verse is talking about the rapture or the second coming. So you have to look at the context. We must always remember that every verse is part of a chapter. Every chapter is part of a book. And that book of the Bible is part of the entire Bible. There's a theme to the Bible. There's a theme to each book of the Bible. And so any verse that's found therein is going to fit within the context, context, context. Amen? So, we need to be very careful then. When we begin to look, if this verse is rapture or second coming, we need to realize that it's very important that we differentiate between the two. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about the differences. And so, let's see what the Bible teaches about the rapture and the second coming. Okay, you ready? I hope you have something to write with. This will be posted later and I will share notes, but it's always good for us to write the things that we're studying. Um, highlight maybe or underline the verses. Uh, get your notebook and your pen ready. Take notes. Uh, we see it, we hear it, we read it. All of those things help us to remember much, much better. So what does the Bible teach about the rapture and the second coming? Well, the rapture is when Jesus Christ returns from, the, from heaven. He comes in the air to remove the church, that's all the believers in Christ, from the earth. At the rapture, he does not come all the way to the earth. His feet do not touch down upon the earth. At the rapture, he calls forth for the saints to meet him in the air in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We'll talk about a verse or a passage, uh, several verses here in just a moment. Now the second coming is distinguished from the rapture in the fact that when Jesus returns, he comes at his second coming, his feet touch the earth, and he comes with a different purpose. We're going to talk about those differences tonight. But it's when Jesus returns to defeat the Antichrist, to destroy evil, and to establish the millennial kingdom. He will bind Satan during that time before the millennial kingdom. He will be bound for a thousand years during that perfect kingdom rule upon the earth, and then Satan will be released in order to uh, accomplish the final purposes that God has for him. We'll talk about that at another time as well. But the rapture and the second coming are different things. The rapture and the second coming are different things. Now for the rapture, believers who have died will have their bodies resurrected along with other believers who are still living and they will meet the Lord in the air. And this will all occur in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now. Let's, let's talk about a verse. I'm not sure if this verse is here. I don't think this one's here yet, but I want you to open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. I'm saying I don't think it's here. It's not going to be on the screen for you. So grab your Bible. You can do it on your phone or, or hopefully you have a, a regular Bible. And again, if you don't have a Bible, as we've said oftentimes during these studies, please contact our church. We would be glad to get you a Bible. We'd be more than happy to get you a copy of God's Word. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, and 18 is a passage of Scripture taught by the Apostle Paul. It was given to us by the Apostle Paul. This is the portion of Scripture we just finished studying in our Sunday morning services at Grace Point at Eagle Heights. Now this study from this past Sunday was called Our Future Hope. And if you haven't caught that yet, <coughs> excuse me, if you haven't listened to that or, or watched it, I'm not sure if the video is online yet or not. I know for sure the audio is, but if you haven't heard or seen that study, then I would encourage you to go back and, and watch that or listen to it. It's on our website on the sermon page, kapachurch.com, and the title is Our Future Hope, I believe, Our Future Hope. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, and 18 deal with Our Future Hope. Now the Word of God says this, follow along with me. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now that last verse there in verse 18 is very important. We're going to use this teaching. That's what Paul is saying. Use this teaching that I'm giving to you. And he was reminding the Thessalonians of something he had already taught them. Remember, <clears throat> excuse me, remember Paul was with the Christians in Thessalonica for three Sabbaths. So he could have been there a little bit longer, but he taught them publicly for three uh, Sabbaths. So that's roughly three weeks he was able to teach them. Maybe a little longer according to the book of Acts, chapter 17 and following, but it looks for sure we know three weeks he was with them. And during that short time, he had taught them doctrine upon doctrine upon doctrine. And he believed that eschatology was so important, he didn't classify it as a second tier uh, set of doctrine, but he believed it to be so important that during those three weeks, along with soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation, along with ecclesiology, the teachings of the church or the doctrine of the church, and all those other things, he also taught those Christians in Thessalonica, new believers in Christ, he taught them eschatology, the study of the end times. Now, I love the study of the end times. Even before I was a Christian, I was fascinated with you know, th this topic. I wanted to know about 666. What is that? You might be interested to know that there is a, a um, uh, one, one copy of scripture that we have found, one old fragment. It's a piece. Uh, it's on display right now up in Dallas. There's an institute um, for the preservation of, of the, the scriptures. And so uh, da Dan, Daniel Wallace, I believe is his name. I forgot the, the name of the center. But Dan Wallace has found and, and he's helped to catalog. He's traveled the world um, taking um, images and so that we can preserve all of these scripture and so these different copies. But there is a copy that was found. Uh, maybe rediscovered is a better name. But this, this, uh, this copy, I forgot the name. They're usually named like like P51 or P37, different things like that. And I, I forget the name of this one, but this fragment contains a variant reading of the passage in Revelation that deals with the, the, the number of the beast, the, um, the mark of the beast. And so we all believe it to be 666, but in this discrepancy, it reads 616. And so that's interesting. Someone jokingly said that 666 is the number of the beast. That's his address, but 616 is the neighborhood in which he lives. And so I think that's funny because I love eschatology. My family stared at me like, oh my goodness, that's a horrible joke. Okay, maybe so. But it's very interesting. And even before I was saved, I was very interested. I think eschatology is a tremendous thing to help bring people to Christ. Eschatology is very, very interesting. There are many non-believers, many atheists and, and agnostics who also love to study the end times. And so this is a very, very important tool for us to understand. And so we see these words of comfort in verse 18. Paul says, therefore comfort one another with these words. And so he wanted the Thessalonians to know that they could rest assured that their brothers and sisters who died before Jesus came back, they were going to, to join the believing Christians when Jesus comes back. They were going to join them in meeting Jesus and celebrating for eternity. And so he tells them, I don't want you to be uninformed. And then he begins to give them the order of events. The dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another. Aren't those words of comfort? We don't have to worry about our loved ones who have gone before us missing out if they're in Christ. Everyone who dies in Christ, everyone who dies a Christian, everyone who dies placing their faith in Jesus Christ, who are believing in Him unto salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, to the glory of God alone. Amen? Every one of those brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone before us, who have died, They've, 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 they've gone before us. Their, their spirits are with the Lord now. And one day at the rapture of the church, their bodies will be called up. They will be joined together. I keep snapping. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. That's not for, for any kind of hypnotic effect. I just, a twinkling of an eye. That's, that's a very, very, that's a nanosecond. It's a very, very quick happening. That's what's going to occur at the rapture. Well, there's another passage in 1 Corinthians 15. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 
verses 51 <coughs> excuse me, through 53. We'll look at this passage. I believe this passage, along with many others um, alive today, many other theologians who have gone on before us as well, believe this passage is pertaining to the rapture <coughs> of the church also. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 53. The Word of God says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, there it is again, at the last trump, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 53. Now the word rapture, someone might argue, you believe in the rapture? Well, the word rapture is not even found in the Bible. And if they're talking about in English, I would say, correct, you're right. The word rapture is not in the Bible in English. But my friends, make no mistake, the word rapture is in the Greek text of Scripture. Our English just translates uh, from the Greek. And so we see rapture occurring in several places we're going to talk about. They're in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. We just read about the being caught up. That is a translation of this word rapture. Now the word rapture is an English translation of the Latin, which is a translation of the Greek. Now in Greek, the word for rapture is the word harpazo. Harpazo. And if you want to know how to spell that, we would transliterate that into English, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. P-A-Z-O. Some people put a D in there, but it's H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. It means to carry off, to snatch up, or to grasp hastily, very quickly, hastily. So it's to be grasped, seized, caught up, pulled away. Sounds like a cheer, maybe, right? But uh, that's what harpanzo means. Now, harpanzo is Greek. And so when the Bible, when the scriptures were translated from the Greek into Latin, they used a different word. The word in Latin is the word raptus, okay? Raptus, R-A-P-T-U-S. R-A-P-T-U-S is how we would transliterate that out from the Latin. It's the same word as harpazo. And so our word rapture comes from that Latin translation of the Greek word harpanzo, meaning to be caught up, snatched away, uh, grasped quickly. And so when we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17 here, we're seeing that we who are alive and remain will be caught up, right? Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's that word, harpanzo, um, raptus, or rapture. And so that's why we say the doctrine of the rapture is biblical. It is scriptural. <clears throat> Excuse me, got a cough here tonight. Just, uh, you have to forgive me for that. But uh, the word rapture is actually in the Bible. And so the rapture of the church then, the rapture of the church, it is taught in the Bible. So the rapture is when Jesus meets us in the sky. He meets us in the clouds. He calls the dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain are caught up together with them. We're changed in a moment. The corruptible part of us is changed into the incorruptible part of us. Our bodies then, our bodies and our souls meshed together in a fashion that will be uh, able to stand in the presence of God in all of His glory for all of eternity. That's what's going to happen in that moment. What a glorious thing. Amen? And so, the rapture is when Christ returns to the earth to remove believers from the earth. He, he doesn't come to the earth, excuse me. He comes in the clouds. We meet him in the air. But the second coming is when he comes down literally to the earth to destroy evil and put an end to the Antichrist, the false prophet, to contain Satan. He'll bind Satan for a thousand years. And, and while I've brought that up again, let me just say, because I love to remind our dear brothers and sisters in Christ about this because there are so many wrong teachings, so many false teachings about our ability to bind Satan. We talk about naming it, claiming it, and binding Satan. And I bind Satan from this, and, and I declare Satan can't have this, and he can't have that. And folks, the Bible doesn't give us that authority or that power. None of us can bind Satan. Only the Lord Jesus will bind him when he comes at his second coming. He will take hold of him. He'll throw him. He'll cast him violently into the pit where he'll be bound for a thousand years until Jesus allows him to come out one final revolt, and Jesus will stop him like that. That 
that final revolt. I know it sounds strange. If he's caught, why in the world would God release him? Well, there's a purpose for it, and we'll talk about that purpose in a future uh, study. So, so that's kind of a little hook there. I want to hook you and uh, get you to keep watching because we'll hit that maybe next week or the week after uh, in the future. And so, so that's the binding of, the, of, of Satan and, and, and those things. That takes place at the second coming. So the rapture and the second coming are two different things. So let's look at the next point here. What does the Bible teach about the rapture and the second coming? Well, let me just say it a different way, all right? The rapture <clears throat> is when Christ returns to remove the church. The second coming is when he comes to defeat. I'm having trouble here. He comes to defeat Satan. Now, at the rapture of the church, or to defeat the Antichrist and then capture Satan, at the rapture of the church, believers will meet the Lord in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. We just saw that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. The Lord himself will descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture of the church. The second coming, believers return to the uh, earth with the Lord. Now turn to Revelation chapter 19, verse 14. Revelation chapter 19, verse 14, we see this passage. So Revelation chapter 19, let me turn there as well, <clears throat> verse 14. Revelation 19, verse 14 says this. In fact, if you will, go ahead and back up. I do this all the time on Sunday morning, so back up to verse 11. Revelation 19, verse 11 and following. I'll give you a second to get there. It's good to see so many of you on here. Wow. See a bunch of different streams where people have shared and started watch parties. And so, thank you. Hello to all you guys. It's good to see y'all. I see some amens. Keep them coming. <laughs> all right. Ro uh, Romans. Revelation. Romans. That's a whole nother study. But Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 and following. This is John the Revelator, right? The Apostle John writing. He says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and he, <clears throat> his name is called the Word of God. Folks, who is this? This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. His name is called the Word of God. Verse 14. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. I'm going to keep going because I love this passage. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Dear friends, that is Jesus Christ himself returning in glory, in majesty, in power at the second coming. And notice what it says in verse 14. The armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean were following him on white horses as well. That is the church, dear friends. That is those believers who have died and, and gone on and those believers who have been raptured before the tribulation. They are the armies dressed in clean white linen. And if you want to know more about that, let me just give you a note. Jot down Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. What verses? That's right. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. There's a lot of it, two whole chapters. It deals with the seven churches of Revelation, those seven churches that are identified, right? These were real churches that were in existence during the writing of the book of Revelation in that first century. The Apostle John writing in the late 90s, around 96, 97 AD, right before his passing. And so he writes to seven of the churches. There were many churches in existence already at that time. He writes to seven of them. They formed um, uh, an arc here, a, a route, a circular route. It was a common mail route uh, in the region of Turkey, around that region where they were all uh, had been founded. And so you can read about those seven churches. And while you read about those seven churches, you'll see the promise that God makes to the believers. And he talks about those overcomers. Christians are the overcomers. He talks about them being dressed in white fine garments, garments, robes that are white and fine. And, and it's the same description we see here in Revelation chapter 19, verse 14. That's why I believe that 
rapture and second coming are different things. And so the rapture is described again as Jesus coming to meet believers in the air. And we see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 54. I'll give that to you again. It's awkward because I can't see if you're taking notes out there. So I want to be sure and, and try to go slow enough for you to keep up. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50, 50 through 54. 50 through 54. <clears throat> so believers who have died will have their bodies resurrected, and along with believers who are still living, they will meet the Lord in the air. This can occur at any moment, or in a moment rather, in the twinkling of an eye. But the second coming is different, as we read in chapter 19 of Revelation, verses 11 and following. We saw that believers seem to come with Jesus for the second coming. So we'll talk more about that as we progress. All right, how, how are we doing on time here tonight? Halfway done about? All right, this is the long version, so maybe we'll go two or three hours. Uh, I don't think I can do that, but we'll, we'll keep going here for, for a bit longer. So the important differences, again, between the rapture and the second coming. Two different things I want to draw your attention to. First, we see that the rapture of the church, during the rapture of the church, that the rapture occurs before the tribulation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. That's one of those passages I told you to look at earlier. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 deals with this. But we see here again in 1 Thessalonians and then in Revelation that the rapture occurs before the tribulation. We'll look at those scriptures in just a moment. But the second coming occurs after the great and terrible tribulation. Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19. We can't read all of those chapters tonight. That would take us way too long. But we see the second coming happening after the tribulation. Now the tribulation is seven years that the Bible has identified. In fact, it's called the 70th year of Daniel's prophecy. We know that 69 weeks of that 70-week prophecy have already been fulfilled. 69 weeks have been fulfilled and there is a gap. There's a gap. There's been a gap of 2,000 years roughly since Jesus Christ came upon the earth. He lived a sinless life. He gave his life as a propitiation for us as the atoning sacrifice, the only one worthy to pay for our sins, right? Amen? And so but after that, Jesus was crucified, dead, buried, and then he rose again some 40 days later. And so now, since that ascension of Jesus Christ, we know that Jesus Christ will come again in the same way we saw him going up, right? He's going to come down, but when he comes back at his second coming, it will happen after that 70th week that Daniel talks about, that we read about in, in, in Zechariah, in, um, in uh, Ezekiel, and some other passages, but also in First and Second Thessalonians and in the book of Revelation. The tribulation is that 70th week. It's seven years that have been identified as horrendous. It'll be hell on earth, literally. It'll be the wrath of God poured out upon all of those who reject him. It'll be poured out for a purpose to bring Israel to faith. It'll be poured out for several other purposes under that, which again, here's the hook line, got you on the bait, or yeah, with the bait on the hook. We're going to talk about that and a little more detail in the future. Tonight, we just want to focus on rapture, second coming differences. We'll pick up on those other details if you're interested in the days ahead. So the rapture occurs before the tribulation. The second coming occurs after the tribulation. So let's look at a few of these passages. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. So I'll give you a minute to turn there because guess what? I too am turning there with you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. And friends, this is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. This is a passage I would uh, encourage us all to memorize and to hold on to. Write it down on an index card or a, or a post-it note. Put it on the mirror or something. Put it on your dashboard and look at it at stop signs and red lights when you're stuck in traffic, not while you're driving, okay? That's, that's when you look at your, your social media. No, don't do that. That's when you look at the road in front of you and you look, check your mirrors to your sides and, and in front of you there, looking behind you and all those things. You don't get on social media. Anyway, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 deals with the rapture of the church. And here's why. 
It says, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many people would say that this verse is talking about hell. God has not appointed us and destined us for hell. And I would say heartily, amen. God has not done that. But dear friends, you must not miss the point that the tribulation is identified as the period of God's wrath. It's laid out for us in First and Second Thessalonians, but predominantly we see Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19 until Jesus comes again at his second coming there in Revelation 19 verse 11 and following. We see that the tribulation is going to be literally a time unlike anything else the world has ever experienced. And so right now, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as bad as this quarantine has been for so many people, I mean, think about all of those folks who have lost jobs. There have been so many jobs. And I saw a statistic today. Um, I, I haven't fact-checked it and looked back, but it looks to be legit. It came from, it looked like a, a legitimate job tracking um, organization. It said that there were some 40%, I forgot exactly, 41, 42% of the jobs that have been lost are, are the businesses, I'm sorry, 40 something percent of the businesses that have been closed down already during this quarantine most likely will not even start up again. Folks, that's sad. That's sad. It was, it's, it was unnecessary in my humble opinion, but as bad as that is, lives have been lost, and that's tragic. I'm not trying to minimize the, the death of folks, um, friends, loved ones, neighbors, those co-workers, whoever it might be, not at all trying to minimize the death of those people to COVID-19. But folks, as, as tragic as this has been, as painful as this has been being quarantined, not being able to assemble together, not being able to go to work and, and do those things like we're supposed to do. As tragic as that has been, it's nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing compared to what the great tribulation is going to be like. The tribulation, the Bible says, is when the wrath of God is poured out on the earth and upon those who do not believe upon Jesus Christ. And we don't want that for anyone, but it's going to serve the purposes of God. The purpose is that folks would be drawn to faith and salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen? And we'll talk more about that purpose of the tribulation later. But just note that 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 promises that God has not appointed us to wrath. He has not appointed us to wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He will rescue us from wrath, from His wrath, from the wrath of God the Almighty. Now turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We're trucking along here. We're barely making any headway. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. I may go a little bit quicker now, but Revelation 3, verse 10 says, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life. Christ has promised. He's faithful. He's faithful that he is going to give that crown of life to believers. We'll talk more about that verse a little bit later in our study and clear up some confusion maybe that surrounds that verse. But the second coming occurs after the great and terrible tribulation. Rapture before, second coming after. They can't be the same event if they take place at two different times. Amen? So let's read Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19 now. No, we can't do that. That's way too long. But just note that the tribulation is dealt with in those chapters. Revelation 6 7, 8, 9, all the way to chapter 19, verse 10, deals with the tribulation. And then, in Revelation 19, 11, we see the second coming. We see the second coming. So, at the rapture of the church, at the rapture of the church, <clears throat> before, at the second coming, that's after, what's in the middle? The tribulation. The tribulation separates those two events. Now, here's another thing. Another difference, another important difference we'll see. The rapture is the removal of believers from the earth as an act of deliverance. So Christ comes, he calls forth the saints to meet him in the air. The dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. Remember, here's the snap. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye changed. The corruptible is put off. We've put on incorruption now. We've been changed. We've been fit for heaven. And so we meet him in the air. He comes to remove us from the earth as an act of deliverance, rescuing us taking us away from the tribulation that's about to occur. 
but the second coming includes the removal of unbelievers as an act of judgment. So again, you see, excuse me, again, you see these are two different events. The rapture, Christ comes for the saints, meets us in the air. At the second coming, he comes in judgment against unbelievers. He comes to the earth, literally, his feet touch down on the mount. He comes to the earth. And so, that's two different events. Again, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. And I guess for time's sake, we won't read all of that again. But just remember, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. Verse 17, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with those who have gone before us, right? We'll meet Jesus and them all together in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Folks, it's not comforting to think we have to endure seven years of, of hell on earth with the possibility and the probability that most of us won't even make it through that tribulation because the bulk of the population of the earth will be obliterated. Over a half of the population of the earth will be dealt with severely. They'll meet their end during the wrath of God in that tribulation. You can learn more about that if you look at our Revelation studies, particularly chapter 6 through 19 where we deal with the tribulation in our studies, you can find those on our website. But the rapture is the removal of believers from the earth as an act of deliverance. We also see, again, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, the reason we believe in the rapture is because God has not appointed us for wrath. And the tribulation is the wrath of God being poured out. We don't want to miss that. Or we want to miss that, but I'm saying, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you don't want to miss the fact that the wrath of God is poured out during the tribulation. So please don't miss that important reality from Scripture. The second coming, however, as we said, includes the removal of unbelievers as an act of judgment. And Matthew, turn to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to Matthew. Matthew chapter 24 deals with this. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24. Go ahead and get there. I'll give you the verse. Matthew chapter 24. Well, you see it there. It's verse 40 and verse 41. This entire chapter deals with parts of the end times, Matthew 24 and 25. Uh, we can teach through these verse by verse, maybe on a Wednesday night also, if you want to go back through those. It deals with the second coming of the Lord, deals with the tribulation, some other things here. It deals with the Antichrist. It deals with uh, his coming and setting up himself as God in the temple that has to be rebuilt for his doing that. Uh, interesting stuff. Some of my favorite topics in Scripture other than the soteriology verses, the verses that deal with how God saves us. But here in Matthew chapter 24, look at verse 40 and verse 41. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 40 and 41. The Bible says this, Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Now, we may think, oh, that's dealing with the rapture. But friends, that's not the rapture. If you look at the context of what's happening here, you'll see that the context is wrath. The context is judgment. And so one is taken. The one that's taken is the one that's taken for judgment. That's not the rapture of the church. That is what happens at the second coming. And so we see that is another difference. The rapture, Christ takes believers. The second coming, he comes for unbelievers and he snatches them up for judgment those are two different events so the lord is not destined christians for wrath but unbelievers will meet god in judgment and the second coming is that time of judgment where jesus comes back to exercise that judgment upon unbelievers and so we see that matthew 24 verse 40 and verse 41 that is again another verse that deals with the differences between the two. There are many. We're just looking at a few tonight, as time will allow. And so let's look at another. And this is one of my favorite in discussing the differences. That rapture is imminent, meaning it could take place at any moment. There is nothing that has to take place now for Jesus to come back in the rapture, at the rapture, for the catching up, the snatching away of believers in Christ. There is no sign that has to precede that event. It's a signless event. Now, many of our brothers and sisters don't believe in the rapture because they think the Bible, or they think we believe in a secret rapture. And the rapture is not secret in the way I've heard many of my friends who, 
who don't agree with me about this. Uh, there's a few um, who don't believe in the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, but, but one of them uh, believes it's because it's secret. It's a secret rapture, and the Bible doesn't teach that, and I agree with him. The Bible doesn't teach a secret rapture. It just teaches a rapture. And just think about this. When Jesus Christ comes and when he calls forth that trumpet of God, um, the dead in Christ and the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain are called up together uh, in the air always to be with the Lord. But he snatches us away when suddenly all the Christians that are alive at that time and all the Christians that are gone before, when all of us are caught up out of here and taken away, that's not going to be a secret. Someone's going to notice that suddenly all the churches are empty. All the Christians at work are gone. Someone's going to take note of that. That's why I say it's not a secret event. It'll take place just like other um, saving events have taken place throughout history. Just think about when Noah and his family, Noah and Mrs. Noah, their sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. So eight all together. They were rescued from the wrath that came upon the earth from God when God exercised his judgment upon all of those who would not believe in him with the great flood that occurred. Genesis chapter 6 through chapter 9. A little bit following that, but primarily Genesis 6 through 9. And so we know that they were able to be rescued in the ark. They were sealed in by God, and they rode out over above all of the tribulation. They were rescued from that while the others perished. But it wasn't secret. It wasn't secret. It was something that was proclaimed for over a hundred years. And they're building this ark, 120 years, preparing. Um, and the Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. So Noah, his family, must have been sharing the, the truth that judgment's coming, the flood is coming, be saved. And what did people do? They mocked, they ridiculed, they ignored, just like people mock the ideal of our being saved in the rapture today. Friends, it's not a secret rapture, but it is going to occur, and the unbelieving world will be totally taken for, for, by surprise. The Bible says that we in Christ are supposed to be watching, to be watching and to be ready for the return of Christ. Again, because it's imminent. It can happen at any moment. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 says that we are looking, we are looking for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're looking for Jesus to come back. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say that we're looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for the great and terrible tribulation. We're looking for Christians to be martyred. We're looking for signs in the sky like the, like the sun going out, the moon turning to blood, and, and, and the stars falling from the heavens as Matthew chapter 24 and 25 record. record. I mean, all of those things happened before the second coming. And Titus here, in Titus 2.13, the Apostle Paul is telling Titus, we're not looking for that. Christians, we are looking for Jesus. We're looking for the appearing. It's called our blessed hope. That's why we, we teach the rapture as that, the blessed hope, the return of Jesus Christ for the saints. What a glorious thought, amen? But in 1 Corinthians 50 through 54, again, I know we read two of these verses earlier, but let's, let's go back. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 54. I see more of you have joined on tonight. Hello. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 54, the Word of God says this. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I will tell you a mystery. Now what is a mystery? It's not like we would understand a mystery today. But a mystery in the New Testament is something that's revealed then that had been unknown before. It's something that's always been true, but it was unknown. It was a mystery. And so Paul is telling them the rapture of the church is truth. It is being revealed. I mean, he was getting the word of the Lord. It's true now. This was the mystery that was hidden in ages past, but it's being revealed in that time for his time and for future generations like us to know and to find comfort and hope in. We do not have to face the wrath of God. And so he goes on to say, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the 
There it is. Twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trump of God will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. What a glorious thought. That is a tremendous passage of hope. Folks, we will not face death in this way. We will not face the wrath of God that's poured out during the great and terrible tribulation. And so the rapture is imminent. It can happen in any moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's what we read there in 50 through 51, 52 primarily. But the second coming of Christ will not occur until after a number of other events. There are many things that must take place, many things that have to occur, uh, other end time events that have to take place so that the second coming occurs. Now, can God do anything he wants to do? Yes, but he'll never do anything that will be contrary to his character and his nature, and he does not go against his word. And so he has said that the second coming occurs after the great tribulation. The second coming occurs after seven years of the outpouring of God's wrath. The second coming occurs according to 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and according to um, uh, Matthew chapters 24 and 25 and according to Revelation chapter 6 through 19 and Zechariah and a number of other passages. The second coming can occur until after the abomination of desolation. That is, when the Antichrist sets himself up as God, goes into a temple. Wait, well, well, wait, there is no temple in Jerusalem right now. That means a temple has to be restored. There has to be another temple that is built up upon the Temple Mount. That means there's going to have to be some, some dealings between um, Israel and the surrounding Islamic nations. Um, there are passages in the scriptures that talk about those things, such as Ezekiel chapter 37, 38, 39, and others. But all of those things and more, those things must occur before the second coming of Christ occurs. So look at just a few of these passages. Again, we can't read all of the passages that speak about the tribulation. Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19 primarily. Um, those deal with many of the things that have to occur before Jesus can come back. So if you want to check me on this, tonight after our study, begin reading in Revelation chapter... Um, in fact, I would encourage you, read Revelation chapter 1. Read it all. Read the whole book of Revelation. You'll see chapter 1 deals with the things which were. Chapter 2 and 3 deals with the things which are. The church age deals with the seven churches. And then chapter 4 and following, you'll notice it deals with something in the future. And something's oddly missing from chapter 4 on. After Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, where it says, then after these things, meaning after the things that happened prior, dealing with the church, all of a sudden we don't see the church again mentioned in Revelation until the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation chapter 19, and then the second coming of Christ, where we see those dressed in white, riding on, on white steeds, coming back with Christ. That's the church again. The church is oddly, but thankfully on my part, the church is oddly missing from the tribulation chapters in the book of Revelation. So, second coming occurs after certain other events. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. We see <clears throat> this one who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. That's the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, um, the son of perdition. The Antichrist has a number of names. In fact, why don't you comment down below uh, here in the threads where you're watching if you would like for us to study more in detail about the Antichrist. We could look at the similarities and the differences between the Antichrist and the Lord Jesus Christ. If that would interest you, uh, comment here below and we will <clears throat> study that in a night as well. It's too much for us to look at in more detail tonight. We're coming upon um, about 55 minutes already here, so I want to go ahead and bring us to a close, but soon, not right now, soon. Isn't it funny when preachers say, okay, uh, in closing, and then they preach for 30 more minutes? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Um, my, the peanut gallery here is pointing at me right now. <laughs> um, but in Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 30, 
verses 15 through 30. This is a lengthy passage here, but it deals with the second coming. And it deals with, in fact, just jot it down. We don't have time to look at all of it tonight. But Matthew 24, verses 15 through 30, deals with some of the things that have to take place before the second coming of Christ. Let me just draw your attention to a few of those things. So jumping down here into chapter 24, verses 15 through 30, we see things like um, there will be a great and a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world up until now, nor ever will. Meaning the great tribulation is unlike any other time. So World War One, World War II, World War Three that some people say we're already kind of involved in, all these different skirmishes in the Middle East, or maybe there's a bigger one coming, whatever. But all Vietnam War, every war that has taken place, that will take place, will just be nothing compared to the travesty of the Great Tribulation. All of the sickness, all of the suffering, all of the disease, all the pain. COVID-19 can't scratch the surface of the horrors that will exist during the great and terrible tribulation. And so had those days not been cut short, no one could have been saved. But God cuts it short for the sake of the elect, the sake of the elect. Hmm, who is that dealing with? We'll deal with that. Is that meaning the church or is that meaning Israel? Because dear friends... Israel and the church are not the same. The Bible deals with them as two distinct entities. And we're going to talk about that next week or the week after. And many of the problems pertaining to eschatology that our friends, that our brothers and sisters in Christ have, who disagree with the rapture teaching that we're giving here tonight, many of them err about the rapture and the second coming for this reason, I believe. Not the only reason, but I think this is the key reason. Because they fail to differentiate between the church and Israel. And so when they fail to differentiate between Israel and the church, they misappropriate verses that are aimed at Israel, they give them to the church. They take verses that are aimed at the church and they give them to Israel and they account them one and the same. And folks, that is absolutely tragic for our study of the scripture. Folks, we must really, if you are one who believes the church has or yeah, the church has replaced Israel, and there is no Israel any longer, and there's no scriptures that pertain to the future of Israel any longer. Friends, please, 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 please listen. Heed this warning. Study again. Look at those verses again, and we'll talk about that in the days ahead. So, so comment below if you want to look at the differences between Israel and the church. Just give us a comment here, and we will... Look at that in a Wednesday night upcoming very quickly as well. But he goes on to say that the stars will fall from the sky, the moon will not give light, the sun will be darkened, uh, and then the sign of the man, Son of Man will appear in the sky, and the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And when he comes, he will come down in judgment. That's the second coming, dear friends. And so the rapture can happen at any time. The second coming cannot happen at any time. It has to come only after all of these plethora of events that have to take place before it can occur. So the seven-year tribulation is one such event, and there are many things that have to take place therein that have to occur as well. <clears throat> We've gone almost an hour, so I've got a little bit more. Can we keep going here tonight? Keep going. Y'all said you wanted the long version, so we're going to keep going here. I see some new folks have joined in. We're going to keep going. I've used up all my water. That should be my sign to stop. And yet, I'm going to keep going here because I want to get to a certain point before we end. So where is the church found in each event? We've looked at some important differences. Not all the differences. We've looked at just a few of the differences. And in fact, I've got here, and we'll go over this maybe more next week as well, but I've got here one, two, three, four, five, six. There's about 12, 15 differences here that I've found between the rapture and the second coming. The rapture, I'm just going to bullet these off real quick here and give you. Christ comes in the air at the rapture. Christ comes to the earth at the second coming. Christ comes for his saints at the rapture. He comes with his saints at the second coming. Believers depart from the earth with Christ at the rapture. Unbelievers are snatched away to judgment at the second coming. Christ claims his bride at the rapture. Christ comes with his bride at the second coming. Christ gathers his own at the rapture. Um, at the second coming, it's the angels who are gathering the elect. Christ comes to reward believers at the rapture. Christ comes to judge unbelievers at the second coming. The rapture was not in the Old Testament. The second coming of Christ was predicted numerous times in the Old Testament. 
Um, there are no signs for the rapture. It's an imminent event, meaning it can take place at any time. But the second coming of Christ is portended or predicated upon many signs that have to take place before it can happen. The rapture is a time of blessing and comfort. We are to comfort one another with those teachings about the rapture. But the second coming is a time of destruction and judgment. And I've got verses for all of these different ones that we haven't talked about so far tonight. The rapture involves believers only. The return of Christ at his second coming involves Israel and the Gentile nations. Those are two different events. The rapture will occur in a moment. Uh, in a twinkling of an eye, and only his own will see him. But the unbelievers will note that something cataclysmic has, a, has occurred. When millions of believers disappear, people will notice. It will not be a secret, but they will just not understand. Like when Paul was saved, or should I say, like when Saul, the persecutor of the church, was saved on that road to Damascus, on his way to capture and kill other Christians, other followers of the way, other believers in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ appeared to him. Uh, Paul was blinded. Well, Saul, again, his name was changed then to Paul. He became a mighty, mighty warrior for Christ, writing um, a number of the Old Testament books, right? But those people who were with him, they saw a light and heard some noise, but they didn't hear the words of Jesus, meaning it wasn't a secret they just didn't understand what happened. I think that's very similar to what's going to happen at the rapture. But there are many, many other things. After the rapture, the tribulation can begin. But after the second coming of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ can begin. Um, at the rapture, Christ comes as the bright and morning star. At the second coming, he comes as the son of righteousness. And so there are many, many differences between the rapture and the second coming. But now, let's talk about something else. Let's see, just very briefly here, I'm going to go a little quicker now, so hold on. Let's see, where is the church found in each of these events? Where is the church found in each of these events? Miss Judy says, hey, let's study it all. And I say, amen. Should the Lord tarry in his return for us by way of rapture? We'll try to try to cover every single one of these things we've talked about tonight. So, Miss Becky, please remind me of all the things I said we're going to look at in the coming Wednesdays, okay? Amen. So, where is the church found? Well, number one, at the rapture of the church, Jesus comes for his church. We see that in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 14 through 17, which we've already talked about. But I want you to look at John chapter 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. I told our church... Um, this past week that we were going to talk about this in great detail and well we're not going to have time to do that tonight I, w I wasn't trying to lie to you I just you know me I get excited and I bit off more than I can chew but this passage primarily next week we're going to dive into and we're going to see all the similarities between first Thessalonians 4 and John chapter 14 we're going to look at those things in great detail next Wednesday so for tonight just note that at the rapture Jesus comes for his church and at the second coming Jesus comes with his church that's different, isn't it? You can't come for and with at the same time. You can't come for and with at the same time. Well, that's very discombobulating, <laughs> very confusing. So look at John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Now get this, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. And I'm going to keep reading. This isn't part of our study tonight, but this is a great passage. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, oh, you'll figure it out. No, that's not what he says. Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Dear friends, listen, there's only one way to heaven. There are not many roads. We can't coexist thinking that we're all going to go to heaven. It's ludicrous to try to imagine coexisting in John Lennon fashion. Don't get me off on that right now. I'm trying not to. All right, stick to the point, Becky says. So we, we can't all coexist in that way that they dream of. There's not going to be a utopia upon this earth with the current structure of the political ruling and, and all of the world religions. Uh, even just this past week, I saw that, that Pope Francis called on all faiths, all those who pray, 
to, to come together and pray for an end. Let's all agree together, whatever faith you may find yourself in, to agree together, let's pray for an end to COVID-19. Folks, there is no harmony between light and darkness. Christians, we have nothing in common. Pope Francis, you are wrong. You are antichrist with that kind of thinking. Not the antichrist, you are of antichrist with that kind of belief and teaching and, and, and calling on people to, to pray uh, along to the same God as Buddhism, as Islam, as Mormonism, as whatever ism there may be. We do not all pray to the same God. There is one way to heaven, and it's not found in Baha, it's not found in Allah, it's not found in, in Buddha, it's not found in, in New Age teachings like Oprah and others pr proclaim. It's not fa found in finding our, our true self and our higher self. It's found in Jesus Christ, for there is no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved. Amen? Only one way. And so, in John chapter 14, we read about Jesus coming for his church. He says, if I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. What a glorious thought that is. But at the second coming, <clears throat> very quickly, Christ comes with his church. With his church. Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 5 uh, Turn there if you can. It's in the Old Testament. That one may be hard to find. Uh, just jot it down. Zechariah 14, verse 5. The Word of God says, You will flee by the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azale. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord, then Yahweh my God will come and all the holy ones with him. At the second coming, he comes with the church. Um, also we read, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. The second coming of Jesus Christ. In Jude chapter 14, it was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, who I could chase some rabbits dealing with this passage, but I want... In, in Jude 14, it was also about these men that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones. Enoch prophesying about the coming, the second coming of Christ with his holy ones. Second coming, dear friends. And then Revelation 19, 14, we looked at earlier. Revelation 19, 14 says, And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Revelation chapter 19, verse 14. The rapture, Jesus comes for his church. The second coming, he comes with his church. Those two things cannot be one and the same. They are two different events. Another thing, where does Jesus appear in each event? Where does Jesus appear in each event? Well, at the rapture of the church... <clears throat> need to get to this slide. Where does Jesus appear? At the rapture of the church, Christians are called up to meet Jesus in the air. We saw that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and following. I believe it's also there in John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. But where does Jesus appear at the rapture? Well, he appears in the air. Christians meet Jesus in the air. He does not return to the earth at that point. But at the second coming of Christ, the feet of our glorious Savior and Lord Jesus Christ return all the way to the earth, touching down on that mount. In fact, the Bible says that mount splits in two. There's a river that's going to flow in a new direction at that coming. That is different than the rapture. Rapture, air, second coming, comes all the way to the earth. Zechariah 14.4 Zechariah 14, 4 says, In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Second coming, he comes to the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move towards the north and the other half will move toward the south. Friends, that is a cataclysmic event. A mountain will be split. It's going to have cataclysmic um, uh, um What's the word I'm looking for? It'll have consequences. Thank you. That's the word. It, there'll be cataclysmic consequences that will take place, that will occur when this mountain is split and moved in different directions. A river, again, flowing in different directions. But folks, the main thing is to note that it's not the same as the rapture. The rapture is in the air. The second coming is upon the earth. Saints meet Jesus in the air for the rapture. The 
the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives, and there is a cataclysmic event with all of the things that unfold thereafter. Those are different things. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 21, we won't go over those again tonight for time's sake, but those deal with that second coming passage as well. So we've seen now a couple of things. Where's the church, right? Where's Jesus during each of those events? Now, another thing I want us to look at, just very quickly, I'll give you another difference here. Who is taken and who is left at each event? We, we kind of hit on this earlier on, probably at the top of our study. But who is taken and who is left? I see my aunt. Hello, Aunt Joyce. It's good to see you out there tonight. Who is taken and who is left? At the rapture, Christians are taken first and unbelievers are left behind. At the rapture, Christians are taken first and unbelievers are left behind. At the second coming, Jesus' feet touch down upon the earth. Whoops, excuse me, I'm reading the wrong thing. At the second coming, the wicked are taken first, but the righteous are left behind. So at the rapture, Christians first, unbelievers, or the wicked, are left behind. But at the second coming, the wicked are taken first, but the righteous, that's the tribulation saints during that time, they are left behind. Now the rapture order we deal with in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We've already looked at that. For time's sake, I won't reread those verses, but I would encourage you to write it down. Look it up after we're done. The second coming verse here, though, Matthew chapter 13, verse 28, 29, and verse 30. It tells us that the wicked are taken first, then the righteous tribulation saints are left behind. So that's Matthew 13, 28 through 30. We read this. And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you gather up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Dear friends, that's talking prophetically about the second coming of Christ. What happens with the unrighteous, the wicked, are gathered up for destruction, and then the righteous are gathered up for his barn, for glory, dear friends. So who's taken and who's left behind? Those two things are different. Different people are taken, different people are left behind. Now one other quick thing here, one other quick point of difference. I keep saying quick. Maybe I should stop saying quick. Let's just look at one other thing, however long it takes us. Another difference. What will Jesus do at each event? And I think this one's important. What will Jesus do at each event? Friends, note, it's different between the rapture and the second coming. As you can see on the screen, at the rapture of the church, Jesus will gather his bride, the church, unto himself in preparation for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is something that he is preparing and he's going to call us to. And at that marriage supper, there's a lot that's going to happen there, but we're going to, we're going to be fitted in that incorruptible attire, if you will, that glorious white linen. Our bodies will be changed, our soul and our spirit united there um, in, in, in a glorious way, and we will be fit for this marriage supper. Only those who are fit for that supper will partake. And that's what happens at the rapture of the church. Revelation 19, again, Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 9, the Word of God says this, Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saint. saints. Excuse me. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Revelation chapter 19 verses 6 through 9. But at the glorious appearing, at the second coming, Jesus will execute judgment upon the earth and establish the kingdom. Those two things are different, dear friends. Do you see it? The rapture and the second coming cannot be the same event. They are two different things that the scripture speaks of. So we see this in Zechariah chapter 13, verses 3 and 4. 
where the word of God says, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley. We looked at this earlier, and so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. That is different from the rapture, dear friends. Jude verse 14 and verse 15 It's only one chapter. So Jude chapter 1, only one chapter, verses 14 and 15. We looked at these passages earlier. It's that prophecy of Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam talking about the Lord coming, Yahweh coming with many thousands of his holy ones to do what? To execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Dear friends, the second coming, Jesus is coming in his glory for punishment of the ungodly. He's coming to execute his judgment upon those unbelievers. He's coming to smite his enemies. There's a good King James word for you, right? He's coming to smite his enemies with the sword of his mouth, the sword of his spirit, the word of his mouth will strike down his enemies. Someone asked me earlier by text, are we going to have to fight at the second coming? And the answer is that Jesus will take care of all of his enemies with a word, with nothing but a word. He is the all-powerful one, amen, the glorious, omnipotent ruler of all creation, King of kings and Lord of lords, and with but a word, the sword of his mouth, the word of God will strike down his enemies. So, my dear friend, (coughs) Miss Laura, you can do your dance battle if you want to. You can cheer from the sidelines if you want to, but Jesus will do the fighting. Jesus will do the fighting, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. So the rapture and the second coming are what? They are not the same events. They are different. Now, let me just bring us home now, okay? We're really and truthfully on the end here. We're going we're gonna to wrap this up before 8 o'clock. Fingers crossed. But here we go. Let me just tell you why it's so important to keep the rapture and the second coming different. If you're still watching... I've got a low battery warning over here on one of these devices, but if you're still watching, dear friends, you are blessed among all peoples of the earth. I'm I'm just grateful that you're watching still. You're listening. I'm glad that you're still here. But let me tell you why, in just the next few minutes, why it's important. I'm going to give you the verses. Most of these verses we've looked at already, so we will not rehash them. I'm not calling them unimportant, but we've already, already read them. Excuse me. And I just want us to to make note of the points. I just want to highlight a few other things, and then we can go back, because we've all been taking great notes tonight, amen? We can go back, we can re-listen, re-watch, and we can look up these verses again after our study time is complete here in just a few moments. But listen, the rapture and the second coming are different, and it's important for us to differentiate between the two. And here's why. Number one, you're taking notes. Number one. If the rapture and the second coming are the same events, then believers will have to go through the tribulation. If the rapture and the second coming are one and the same event, then believers will have to go through the tribulation. And friends, that cannot be. Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus promises us what? That we have not been appointed to wrath. And what is the tribulation? The tribulation is the outpouring of God's wrath upon unbelievers and upon his creation itself. Don't you know that the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that even creation groans. It longs painfully, longing to be remade. Well, friends, after the second coming of Christ, the world will be remade. New heaven, a new earth. There'll be a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, and a new earth. Everything will be remade, but that's after the second coming of Christ. And so if the rapture and the second coming are the same. Believers go through the tribulation. And dear friends, believers have not been appointed to the great tribulation. We have not been purposed for that. So why else? Another reason. Why is it important to differentiate between rapture and second coming? Because if the rapture and the second coming are the same event, then the return of Christ is not imminent meaning he can't just come back at any time. There has to be many, many signs that have to occur before he can return. And what have we read tonight 
in many of the New Testament books, or several of the New Testament books, but you will find talk about the second coming and the rapture of the church in almost every single New Testament book. Only a few do not deal with the rapture of the church. We can talk about that another time, but folks, just note that if the rapture and the second coming are the same, then his coming is not imminent. But the rapture verses that we read tonight tell us that the church is to be watching and waiting for the return, for he can come for us at any time. That's the rapture. The bride needs to make herself ready for the groom to come and take us to the great marriage supper. Amen? But we saw tonight that the second coming is predicated upon many, many signs. Most of those pertaining to that tribulation period between Revelation 6 and Revelation 19. There has to be a treaty between some new world leader, the Antichrist, who's not been revealed yet. The Antichrist, I mean. He has not been revealed yet, but he will make a treaty with Israel. There will be a new temple. He'll allow them to worship freely upon the mount. They don't have that freedom to worship in a temple right now because there is no temple. So this is a future event. All of those things and many things more have to occur before the second coming. So, again, it's important to differentiate between the two for those reasons. And here's another. <coughs> Here is another, and this will be, um, we'll stop here. There's, a, there's another, but I think we'll just stop here. If the rapture and the second coming are the same event, oh, that's the one we just did. What's the next one? If the rapture and the tribulation, um, in describing, excuse me, <coughs> in describing the tribulation period, those chapters in Revelation, chapter 6 through chapter 19, nowhere mention the church. I mentioned that earlier, so we'll just breeze through this. During the tribulation period, also known as the time of trouble for Jacob or Jacob's trouble, God will again turn his primary attention to Israel. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 and then Romans chapter 11 verses 17 and following. Dealing with the time of Jacob's trouble. The, the, the primary target of the tribulation, the audience primarily is Israel. Yes, there will be Gentiles who will see what's happening and they will come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the purpose primarily is to bring Israel to her knees in repentance. God will go to extraordinary measures to bring them back. And Israel will be saved. I'm not talking about national Israel. I'm talking about spiritual Israel. There's Israel and then there's national. There are people who are just born Jewish. We're not saying that every, every one of them will be redeemed. Many lives will be lost during the tribulation. Folks, do you realize that that's, that should be... That should be fire under our belt to share Christ with everyone today, myself included. We should be burdened to share Christ with everyone we see today because it's going to be very difficult after the church is raptured. Yes, people will be saved. There's going to be 144,000 Jewish witnesses that will go forth during the tribulation and people will hear the message and they will be saved. But dear friends, it, that's not going to happen before for much of the turmoil from the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and, 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 and what not, the vile, the bold judgments, many lives will be lost. Many will perish for an eternity because they've rejected the, the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've rejected the gospel message. And so we should be encouraged to share Christ with people now. So, so just note, here's one, one, one final couple of words here. 20 more minutes. <laughs> just a few more things to th think about in closing. Both events involve Jesus returning. Both events are end-time events. Rapture, second coming. But they are very, very different. And we've seen some crucial differences here tonight. So remember, the rapture, return of Christ in the clouds to remove believers from the earth before God's wrath. The second coming, Jesus returns to the earth. He brings uh, with him his return. The second coming, he brings with him his bride, the church, who has been raptured already. We come back and Jesus executes his judgment upon, uh, he brings an end to the great tribulation, but he brings judgment upon Antichrist, false prophet, and upon Satan himself in those world empires. So dear friends, these things are very, very different. I know I went very quickly there at the end, but I think I've kept this long enough tonight. This is probably our longest Wednesday night study in history of our Wednesday night studies. I think this is 90 minutes close to, right? about 90 minutes here, and there are many of you who are still watching, so thank you for watching with us tonight. Thank you for your patience. <clears throat> I pray that you've been uh, informed tonight, but not just informed. I pray that you've been edified tonight. I pray that you've gained and that I've gained. I pray that we would take these verses and apply them to our lives as wisdom, not just knowledge, 
This is not about winning arguments with our amillennial friends or our postmillennial friends, those kind of things. This is about us having knowledge. This is about us having comfort and hope. And friends, what, 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 what could be more comforting than to know that we will not have to endure the great and terrible tribulation that's coming, according to Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 19. But Jesus Christ will come for his bride, the church, and he will call us away in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and we'll be changed, we'll be called up with him to be with him forever and ever, and all God's people say, Amen. Now let's pray. Father, thank you for this study. Thank you for your word of God. Oh, it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts and just divines soul, spirit. It, 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 it is tremendous in its effect. And we've been blessed tonight, I pray, by your study. I know I have. I'm the one teaching, but, but your word is a blessing, oh God. And so thank you for this word. Thank you for the study tonight. I pray that you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear tonight. I pray that all of those folks who have been with us tonight and for those who will watch us in the days to come, those who will listen in the days to come, that they will, that they will deal rightly with the verses, with the scripture. They will consider. Maybe they don't believe in the rapture, but they will consider the things that we have discussed tonight. And God, I pray that you will draw them to a belief. I know this is not a salvific issue. This doesn't mean that someone will be or will not be saved, but I believe that this is the clearest teaching of your of your passage, <clears throat> excuse me, of your scripture, the passages that we've seen tonight. I believe these are the clearest interpretations of those passages. And so God, I pray that you would just help them to come to understanding tonight. And I pray that we would be encouraged all the more upon realizing what kind of judgment is coming, that we would be encouraged all the more to share Christ with our friends and family before you call us home by way of death or by way of rapture. I pray that we would take serious our charge to be ambassadors of the gospel message, ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming, declaring that there is one way, that is Jesus Christ. There's one truth, that is Jesus Christ. One way, one truth, and there is absolutely one life, ultimately. And that is found in none other than Jesus Christ. And all God's people say, Amen.